we start? Yeah? Do I have to? Do I have to? Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay, welcome, everyone. I'm excited to be talking today about the future of content management. It's this big aspirational topic, so I hope you're ready for some big ideas. Um, and uh, usually I like to give talks that are really specific, like here's a screenshot, go into Drupal and check this checkbox, it's gonna change your life. Uh, this talk is a little bit more about uh, ideas, so I hope you find it still helpful. Um, my name is Suzanne Dergacheva. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm one of the co-founders of Evolving Web. We're a Drupal agency. And uh, at Evolving Web, I get to work on all kinds of different projects. Um, uh, I've been done doing sales and marketing recently. And I'm also uh, the initiative lead of Promote Drupal. So if you're interested in getting involved in marketing Drupal, we'll be pulling some of those ideas into this presentation, but I'd love to get more people involved with that. And uh, yeah, at Evolving Web, we get to work with a lot of different types of clients in higher education and government, um, lots of institutions, and also you know bigger bigger companies. And so I'll be pulling ideas from those those types of projects and my experience working on str uh, content strategy and Drupal strategy over the years into this talk. So I think DrupalCon is really a great opportunity to step back and think about Drupal's position in the bigger ecosystem. You know, often when we're at our jobs, when we're at our desks, we're working on a specific project, we're really in the weeds. Um, so taking a step back and thinking about what role Drupal plays and what Drupal's good at, um, how it compares to other options, but also just what makes it what makes it unique. It is a really unique platform, but we often think about it in terms of our own projects and maybe not so much from an outsider perspective. And I think we can learn a lot just by thinking about what its strengths are and what words we use to describe it. So when I think about how Drupal falls into the landscape of choices you have when you're starting out on a project, you know, I think most people recognize the fact that building something from scratch <laughs> when you're building a, a website or, or an app or an online platform, like. This, this takes a lot of time, it's an expensive option, uh, it's a huge investment, and for a lot of the projects we work on, you know, it's not even something we consider. But there are lots of other choices out there, so we, we often um, think about building on top of a framework, which could give us a solid base of functionality. Um, but if you've ever built on top of a framework before, I used to use Ruby on Rails, and I found that every time I would build a new project, I'd have to think about, well, how are we doing multilingual again? Um, how, does con how is content moderation gonna work? How are all these uh, content uh, editing interfaces gonna fit together? And so there would be a lot of work from scratch that we would be having to build every time. Um, and for those of you who have used more like web builders, like I'm thinking of Squarespace and Wix and s a wealth of similar platforms out there that are kind of um, cheaper options. They often really lower the cost, um, but they provide so few options and so little flexibility that they're not really uh, a viable option for organizations that value compliance and value things like accessibility. So we can often rule out these options. And the sweet spot of Drupal is really for organizations that see the value in more flexibility, but also having a standard approach to things. So what I value about the Drupal community is that you walk in and you see, well, although there are many ways to do things, there's a standard approach to some really valuable core features like multilingual, like how content works, like the whole uh, form API and entity API. And so there's, I think, more standardization in Drupal than we sometimes give it credit for. Um, and this standardization saves us tons of time on projects, and so it kind of puts Drupal in this position of high adaptability, and while not, I don't think we can say that Drupal is low cost, <laughs> it's gonna require less customization than, than these other options. And so on this map of 
options, I put Drupal, but what is the noun that we use when we talk about Drupal these days? I like to think about language, and I like to think about the words that we use. Um, and when I first started using Drupal, I would often use the word content management system. I think we all still use that word um, often in our professional lives. Uh, it's a useful term. Um, and when we first started using Drupal, you know, I, I started 15 years ago, I was really talking about content management from the perspective of, okay, we want other people to be able to edit the website. We don't want to just have static HTML that, you know, a developer, someone who knows HTML has to edit. So we have this value of just having an interface for content editors. But beyond that, when we talk about Drupal content management in particular, we're really Im talking about empowering this site builder. Um, and the site builder in Drupal gets a unique amount of freedom because there's so much configuration and so much you can do by installing modules. And so there's this promise that, you know, there's a great deal of flexibility just in terms of the, the content model of Drupal. And I think this is something we shouldn't underestimate the value of. You know, if you have, if you've ever used other systems, the content model tends to be much less flexible. So in Drupal, we might take for granted the fact that we have multilingual, we have taxonomy, we have uh, references between content, and we have this really robust content, uh, content model, buildability, baked into Drupal. Um, and this gives a huge advantage over more limited CMS options. So CMS, but CMS plus. And when I started, uh, you know, having to sell Drupal to organizations, I found myself often wanting to use this word platform. Do you use the word platform a lot? It's a great word. It's kind of kind of general. People don't know always know exactly what you mean. Um, but when I talk about Drupal and I use the word platform, um, I'm often trying to communicate the fact that it does more than content management. It's a starting point because it can integrate with other systems. It can integrate with other content. It goes beyond this base of content model and content authoring that we that we uh, that we always use. And so, for example, you can extend Drupal's form system. You can extend authentication. Right. You can integrate with your own authentication system. You can totally transform the search interface and make it something much more powerful. And I think really highly valuable, you have all these integrations that are really tightly related to the content. And that's, some that's a really key nuance. So when we're adding functionality on top of Drupal, we can always say, well, I want to add this functionality directly into the content model that I created with Drupal. So th the tight um, integration, for example, with uh, migrations, can maybe you have continuous migrations running on your site, or maybe you have really unique publishing workflows that you want to handle. And so that all this means that Drupal does more than just allow you to uh, manage content-heavy sites, and this distinguishes it from lots of other platforms you might be using, like, uh, like WordPress or other basic CMSs. And I think five to ten years ago, for most of the time I've been using Drupal, I've been talking about Drupal to people in IT, you know, technical decision makers. And they're really, they tend to be sold, if you, if you sell it right, on this concept of Drupal as a platform um, because they value this kind of CMS plus, this type of integration that we can do with Drupal. Um, but these days, I don't know, how, how many of you think you talk a lot to technical decision makers? when you're selling a project. Maybe more of you are talking to marketing decision makers. Maybe some of you aren't selling Drupal, which is, <laughs> which is nice. Um, so so um, I think these, these features of Drupal as a platform, it's still really compelling, but these days we often, it's not often not enough. And a lot of us these days are, are dealing with more competition in the content management space. And we're starting to see Drupal referred to as a DXP, or a digital experience platform. Um, and we know that uh, folks at bigger organizations really like to use this word. It's a nice talking point. It's something bigger that we can try and sell. Um, but what does it all mean? What does it imply? What does, 
digital experience platform really, really mean and what does it mean for Drupal? So I think that just the fact that it uses the word um, uh, platform experience, it's, impl it's implying that we are creating more than websites. And website itself has become kind of this word that we shy away from using. Like somehow if I'm, if I'm redesigning the Drupal.org homepage, <laughs> which is a project uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, I think I would not want to be using the word website because that's not so inspiring to people. People think beyond their websites. They're thinking of, you know, how do I create something that checks all the check boxes? I want marketing automation. I want personalization, multi-channel experience, uh, content distribution. Um, I want to have a CRM that's integrated. And I want to be able to do auditing and reporting of my content to see how successful it is. I want the analytics to be built in. And these are things that marketers uh, tend to think of. And, they, and marketers tend to have this laundry list of, here's all the things I want. And they might not even think of website as you know, the most important part of their digital presence. They're just thinking of, how do I talk to customers? How do I build my funnels? Um, website is just one of these these tools that they want to they want to have built out um, and so I think that when we talk about Drupal as a DXP uh, the challenge is that there's not just one way to build all these things there's not just one CRM that you integrate with Drupal or one type of analytics tool the the real be benefit of Drupal is that you can integrate it with so many different types of tools um, and when we pitch Drupal, I think often we say, oh, it's up to you. You know, you can, you can integrate with whatever you want. Drupal's an open platform. And of course, that's true. Um, but it also leads to this uncertainty. Well, what am I, you know, what am I going to get? It's harder to market something that's so flexible and, and not as defined. Um, and so from a marketing perspective, I think Drupal starts to lose ground when the DXP conversation comes in. It's harder, like I said, it's harder to pitch, it's harder to create demos or documentation because we have so many different options and the options really that are appropriate differ from project to project. So I think what could be valuable for, for us, whether we're building Drupal pro uh, projects, whether we are selling Drupal, <laughs> uh, whatever our role is, I think thinking beyond this DXP term, which is kind of limiting actually, I really like to use the, the term content strategy a lot and to think about Drupal as a content strategy platform. And I think that this emphasizes a bit more Drupal's um, unique selling points in terms of having a great content model that's so flexible and so robust out of the box. So if we talk about Drupal as a content strategy platform, I think it's, it's easier for everybody to um, talk about its, the features that make it great for content strategy and for us all to be telling the same story. Um, so to me, Drupal's strongest unique selling point is the fact that it provides so much flexibility in terms of content authoring, content modeling, um, and building functionality and integrations on top of that content. So here's what that means to me, content strategy, platform, like what is it here that we're actually talking about? So I think that um, with Drupal, it's pretty easy to build something that addresses all of these needs, you know, a, a platform that's organized around user needs. Um, messaging that could be adapted, content that can be integrated, content that's portable, and content that has um, compliance built in. Because with Drupal, we can handle things so granularly. So we can make sure that our content is accessible and that it complies with our brand. So there's lots of things that as an organization we can do. And I'm gonna talk through a few of these. So first I think content strategy, a content strategy platform, the primary audience is who? It's the content editors. So if we really want content, um, content to be the priority, 
Um, what we're building is not a, a website that's going to stay the same always because our content strategy is going to change all the time. Um, but Drupal can handle that because it's got this flexible content model. It has site building tools, um, and so and so it's going to be it's going to be a great platform for this. And for content editors, that means that we need to be ha providing them an interface that they like. Uh, tools for creating content that actually complies, and then also uh, an awareness of how that content is going to be used on the platform. And when we say platform, you know, it could be content that's used in many different places. And for teams of communicators, I think we want them to have this certain type of independence that they get when we build them something with Drupal. So content editors have all kinds of needs. I know there's probably been sessions at this conference about content editor experience. Maybe some of you have gone to the gin uh, session. Maybe it's later today. I'm not sure exactly when it is. Um, but there's lots of discussion around and lots of priority being put on making Drupal more user friendly for content editors. And I think that it's different for each project what user friendly means because some projects have really complex content models and some have very basic. Um, but we can kind of divide content editor needs into different categories. And at the at a baseline, you know, as a content editor, you don't want to be overwhelmed. You don't want to encounter an interface that's just confusing and doesn't speak your language. So there's a base baseline for just what the UI feels like. And of course, the new Claro theme goes a long way to um, the new Claro theme. The Claro theme that's now the default <laughs> in Drupal uh, gives us a good baseline for this. Publishing workflows, depending on the project, lots of different requirements that we might have here around translation or change tracking or other approval workflows. Um, content compliance it always has to be part of the picture. That's going to look different depending on what the content actually is. And then flexibility. So as an added layer on the cake, of course, now we have lots of ways in Drupal of you know, using paragraphs, using layout builder to add a certain degree of flexibility that we might need for certain types of content. And in general, the goal is to have the less separation between content experts and users. So getting content experts actually involved in conversations about what should this website do, um, that's going to be really valuable. So what makes Drupal a great content strategy platform in particular, like we talked about a lot of needs. Um, but I think it's just this ability to adapt the UI to, your gov to, to the content strategy that you have. Um, I think when people are cr uh, planning out projects, they often let the technology lead. So you often think like, okay, um, we have a new project. We really want to use Layout Builder for that project. We're going to go all in and give tons of flexibility because that's what Drupal's good at. Or, um, okay, we have, a, we have a desire to use decoupled Drupal. So we're going to let that lead and we're going to um, follow that and um, use all the shiny new tools. Um, Sometimes I think people get excited about things like personalization or marketing automation, and then they, lead, they let that lead the project. Like, oh, how are we going to make sure that this content is really uh, you know, customized for every audience? And instead, I think it's important to start with the content strategy, and in particular, uh, content governance. So for those of you who have never thought about governance before, governance is like when you take all those content structures that you've built in Dr out in Drupal, and you decide who's actually responsible for these things, and how often do they have to get updated. Um, and why are we building a website in the first place? And if we have a thousand websites, you know, why do we have a thousand, and who gets to decide when we create a new one? Um, so if you start with that, um, and let that kind of guide the what the content editing experience is and what the workflows are, it's going to lead to better results. And that, of course, is what Drupal's great at doing. Um, 
So Drupal has a great deal of flexibility in all these areas. And then in terms of standardization, um, this is kind of the counterpoint to flexibility. We can provide so much flexibility to content editors that they don't really know um, where to start. They might end up with so many options that they don't know how to make the website comply with your brand. They aren't sure how accessibility sh requirements should be met. Um, and so we also need to make sure that when we're building out a platform in Drupal, that we as the um, platform providers are taking responsibility for compliance. And if you have many sites, of course, providing standardization across those sites is also going to be helpful. And Drupal also does a great job of this, right? Um, providing things like themes and content components and modules that we can reuse from site to site. I'm excited about the new recipes initiative, the recipes and distributions, because I think it's going to make some of this reuse of things like content components um, easier. Okay, so this, I paint this picture of, yeah, Drupal's great for your content strategy platform and just do content strategy and it'll all be great. But uh, this is the fun part of the presentation where I talk about what's hard <laughs> and what you can actually do next. So the hard part, so I think um, one, one hard part is that um, when we talk about flexibility, we might be thinking about Drupal from the perspective of being a Drupal developer when you can go in and change everything and you can, you know, you can add new content types and install new modules. Um, but the per from the perspective of non-developers, Drupal doesn't always feel flexible. Um, and so figuring out the governance for who can make changes and making sure people are empowered, this is actually harder than it seems. Um, Customizing the content editing UI and moderation workflows, this actually takes time. A lot of projects don't budget for this, and so then we don't end up with the results we expect. And it's easy in Drupal to add lots of things, like I want to add a million um, moderation states. I'm going to install all these modules, and I'm going to add you know, 35 paragraph types, and then you know, we are using that flexibility but we lose a lot on the consistency side. Um, and with page building tools, it can be very tempting to just provide an infinite number of options. And then content editors actually, while they might be empowered, they also get really overwhelmed. Standardization, I mentioned earlier on that Drupal's strength as a as a platform is that it provides a standard way to do a lot of things like multilingual, like taxonomy, but at the same time, of course, we all know in Drupal that there's many ways to do things. We have this choice on projects now between Paragraphs and Layout Builder, and you might have two sites that you're running for the same organization that use different techniques. And standardizing retroactively when you realize this would be helpful for content editors, this is really hard. Um, and then when new challenges come up on a project like personalization, um, we often say, oh yeah, of course Drupal can do this. Um, we're going to personalize all of this for different types of audiences, all this content we're creating. Um, this can end up with, this can lead to a lot of duplicate content um, that could be very hard to manage. And then finally, the last challenge is legacy content. So who here is working on a, a website that's like more than 10 years old, like you have content from more than 10 years ago, so if you have a significant amount of content from more than 10 years ago, it's likely that you have content that hasn't been updated, where you haven't had a chance to go in and refresh that. You haven't had a chance to make it, make sure it's accessible or make sure that it actually fits into your new content strategy or your new content governance model. So it can be great to think about content strategy for all your new stuff, but going back and applying that to older content tends to be a challenge. So what are a few things you can go back and just start doing uh, at on Monday? <laughs> because, yeah, lots of pie-in-the-sky ideas. Um, first of all, getting content experts involved. This is often an easy thing to do. 
um, if you have a new project to revamp part of your website, build out a microsite, or you know any opportunity to kind of start start some new think thinking and get some new ideas going. Um, involving content experts, involving people who know the content well, either as content editors or as subject matter experts. This is going to help prioritize the needs of content and the needs of those actual users. Um, yeah, often they're the ones who understand it the best. Documentation. <laughs> I know documentation is often, oh, we have, yeah, we have a we have documentation, we have a manual somewhere that explains how to use this, this website. Um, but I find that documentation is often written from more of a technical point of view. We often tell people, oh yeah, if you want to create this type of content, here's the steps to do it, and here's all the fields to fill in, and here's how they work. And we do a great job of that. Um, but what I see very rarely is documentation that actually explains, well, here's five content types, here's why you would pick which one. And if you have all these components that you provide as part of like a page building experience, uh, like paragraph types, block types, here's examples of why you would use each one, and here's how to make sure that you have the right balance of text and images, um, and here's how they should actually um, go about helping you communicate what you want to communicate. So using real examples with real content that apply to the organization you're building for. This is something rare, but incredibly valuable. Um, prioritizing content governance. So um, it's great to go in and say, here's what we want the website to look like. Um, here's the information architecture that supports that. That's all great, but um, if you don't make a plan for how is this content all going to be kept up to date, who's responsible, how often should they be going in and looking at it, and what defines success for each type of content, um, then you're almost guaranteed that you'll have to come back in a few years to refresh because the site will not, will not keep its content strategy over time. So if you're investing in content strategy at all, you should be also spending a bit of time on content governance. And investing in cleaning up legacy content, you don't have to wait for a big, huge migration to do this. And in fact, now in the Drupal community, we have um, you know, a transition from Drupal 9 to 10 that's very smooth. We don't have to migrate our content anymore uh, from one, one version to another. Um, and this is fantastic news, but it also means that there's nothing necessarily to prompt us to say, oh, well, we should really go in and look at all of our legacy content and clean it up. So taking the time, you know, iteratively to go back and saying, oh yeah, we do have a lot of content that's we've never we haven't looked at in in years. Um, taking the time to address the the outdated content that you surely have. Uh, <laughs> this this is uh, going to be a valuable use of time, and not something that you have to wait for a big project to do. Something you can start figuring out. Um, so those are lots of next steps that we can do on our projects, but what are some next steps for Drupal? So this is what I'm going to close with. Um, I think that there's lots that the Drupal community is doing to make Drupal an even better platform for content strategy. This is a priority that I've seen you know, in the last few years, that, um, but that's relatively new in Drupal, which is very exciting. So I think there's a lot we can do on two fronts. Um, first of all, the content editor experience in Drupal, of course, is a lot that we do from project to project to customize that experience for the content of the project and the users of the platform. Um, but in general, I think Drupal can do a better job of providing defaults that defaults for content editors that actually say, Dru content editors are the primary audience, so maybe we need to reconsider the labels we're using or the types of interfaces we're providing by default. And this can just be as simple as the language that content editors see. Sometimes you think small things like editing a block, the, the content of a block using the layout builder, you see the word configure instead of the word edit. And small changes like this 
um, can really help content editors feel more like uh, they're the ones that are the primary users. Um, things like creating a toolbar, an admin toolbar that's optimized for content editor, uh, the content editor experience rather than the site builder experience. And then improving features that content editors really value like preview, adding things like autosave. Of course, these are things we can improve on our individual projects, but making them work better in Drupal as a whole, I think will we'll really benefit everyone. Um, and then the other idea is um, how can we draw the line between content and configuration? So I think going back to the first part of my presentation, I was talking about, oh, Drupal was you know, built as this great CMS. It has this promise that site builders can go in and um, do great things in Drupal. But I think it's hard for people to see, hard for content editors and hard for site builders as well, to see what's the difference between content and configuration. I go in and I added a vocabulary, I go in and I added a taxonomy term, I added a menu item, I update a permission, <laughs> and I sort of lose track of did I update the content of this website or did I update the configuration? Um, and showing users the difference between those two things in the admin UI so it's really transparent. When am I updating the platform and when am I updating the content of my website. Um, I think this that just making this clearer could help um, and help remove remove some barriers uh, for the what content what site builders can do. Um, and there's already barriers being removed for site builders every day, right? We saw in the strategic initiatives presentation on Tuesday all the great work that's being done on automatic updates and project browser, and this is, of course, removing barriers for site builders every day. But I think we just need to make things a bit more transparent so you can see, am I updating the content? Am I updating the, the platform? So hopefully these are things we can all work on together <laughs> and develop some best practices for. So a couple, uh, Last things, evol Evolving Web um, offers Drupal training. I just wanted to give a quick plug. We have a lot of tracks that we offer. Um, we offer this as part of the Discover Drupal program that the Drupal Association runs, and we also offer our training program to everyone. So uh, we have professional courses you can sign up for, lots of different tracks and courses available. So if you're interested at all in training up your team or getting training for yourself, feel free to come and chat with me. Um, and of course, I'd also love to chat with you about anything related to marketing Drupal, um, any of the topics I've kind of talked about today. So there's lots of ways to stay in touch. And I think we have time left for questions. So if you have comments or questions, uh, we have a mic here. My question is about uh, legacy content. Uh, as an agency, uh, we uh, don't often uh, manage the content ourselves. Uh, it's often the client. Um, so uh, we would like uh, them to uh, manage their legacy content to reduce uh, uh, lots of problems, but um, uh, we cannot uh, uh, how do we push them maybe to do? Do you have recommendations uh, about this? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, so one thing we've done, because this is often the case on our projects as well, where we don't have a mandate to actually do the content rewriting or editing ourselves. Um, and I find it really useful to just provide some tools for the client, like here's a spreadsheet that provides a list of the priority content, maybe organized by how, um, like the most visited pages, for example, or the pages that are most um, high priority in the in the information architecture. And here's the status to help them kind of track 
is it like like does it need updating does it need updating in terms of seo or accessibility or just getting the content model fitting more with the brand like do you need to convert html to f to the the fields or content components um, and just having a spreadsheet to kind of track that progress and who's responsible and then giving that to them as a template that they can start to use and monitor progress because often um, there's going to be some stakeholder who just wants to see the big number like oh we we updated 300 pages and improved them in this way or we made this much progress with our SEO so it can help with that kind of mm -hmm. success tracking So you mean you would export the pages or the contents into spreadsheets? Um, you could you could export there. You could use um, uh, some tool to just export them from Drupal. You could also use a tool like Screaming Frog to create a report. Kind of depends on what. Um, uh, 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 why why don't, what why don't you at. use Drupal? Uh, well, for example, if you're doing it as you're redesigning the site, and maybe the site is not in Drupal yet, um, there could be reasons to use another tool. Yep. Um, how do you see the convergence of a communication strategy with the content strategy? So I know that oftentimes that's done more on the client side internally, um, but what's your experience of how to support your clients with communication strategy and then translate that into content strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. So often when we're doing discovery for a project, if we're doing content strategy, we'll have workshops that we run around, you know, who are the audiences we're speaking to, um, what should the tone and voice be, what's our assessment of the existing content, and often we're doing that work to directly improve the content of the website. We're thinking about the web content and the content strategy there. But often our findings around tone and voice or around even things like content governance, what content should be updated frequently, often that leads into insights for the, oh, the larger communication strategy. Like here's some um, student testimonials on our website and every time we refresh these we should also take advantage and put those up on social media. So I think um, I think you can provide some findings that could be useful for both. And like sharing that information more broadly with the client's communications team is going to be really valuable. Yep. All right. If not, thank you, Suzanne. Great talk. Thank you.